Galatians chapter 6 verses 1 through 5. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if a man think himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. But let every man prove his own work, and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone, and not in another. For every man shall bear his own burden. Thank you, Daniel, for the scripture reading and the prayer and Brother Philip in leading us so ably in these beautiful songs today. Indeed, it is good to be here on this Lord's Day <coughs> to worship God in spirit and in truth. This morning, I want to talk about something that all of us have, and it's not a million dollars. It's not a mansion. It is not uh, treasures of gold, but it is something that every person has. We all have a burden, a burden. Sometimes we talk about a beast of burden. Maybe you're talking about a donkey carrying a burden or a pack mule. But people have many burdens. People have the burden of sickness and grief or family problems or financial problems. There are those that have the burden of the past and things that they have done that still haunt them. People have all kinds of burdens in life. Some people have handicaps and they have other things that continually are troublesome to them. We want to talk about burdens this morning. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 4, Paul indicates that this is one of the things of living in the body and on this earth. For we that are in this tabernacle, that is, this fleshly body, do groan, being burdened, not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon, that mortality might be swallowed up of life. So as many things about this life that we may enjoy and like, we all know that we have our burdens to bear. We have burdens to bear. The Apostle Peter urges us to cast our burdens and cares upon the Lord. Casting all your care upon Him, for He careth for you. 1 Peter 5 and verse number 7. The late brother Melvin J. Wise made this comment. The deepest and heaviest burdens are not always seen. If we only knew what fierce battles some men and women are fighting, what mighty burdens they are bravely carrying, that would teach us lessons of restraint and charity and cause us to be less harsh in our judgments of others. How true that is. I recall many years ago seeing a young couple. They had a beautiful little daughter. They were a very nice looking young couple in the church. And this young man, he was a preacher. He was very talented as a preacher. And I thought, well, they just seem to have everything going for them because uh, he's doing well in his preaching, his beautiful family and all this. They seem to be happy. But later on, I learned of a burden that that young man had to deal with. And this burden finally caused 
or led to his wife leaving him, she was the burden. Even before they came to the area where they were living, she had gone off and left him before. I knew nothing of this. It was something that was unseen to me. But it goes to show us that people have burdens that we cannot see. Paul said here in Galatians 6 2, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. This is what we have to do as Christians to bear one another's burdens. In Romans 13 10, love is the fulfilling of the law. Galatians 6 2 has love written all over it as we are to help one another with our burdens. Some say that there is a contradiction between Galatians 6.2 and Galatians 6.5 that Daniel read. Look at Galatians 6.5. For every man shall bear his own burden. But verse 2 says, Bear ye one another's burdens. Is this a contradiction? Of course, there are always people trying to find discrepancies and contradictions between the Scriptures. But these are only alleged contradictions. There are no real proven discrepancies or contradictions in the Scriptures. In verse number 2, the word burden, where Paul said to bear you one another's burdens, is from baros in the Greek. And it means load, load of difficulty, sorrow, or pain. And we are commanded to help one another bear our burdens. The word burden in verse number 5 where Paul said for every man shall bear his own burden is from a different Greek word given by the Holy Spirit of course, 1 Corinthians 2.13. It is from the Greek word forshon which means pack. Pack is the whole of one's duties before God for which each one is personally responsible. No one can bear it for us. Every man shall bear his own pack or his own burden. Therefore, there is no contradiction between verse number 2 and verse number 5. Verse number 2 has to do with the loads of life and burdens that we need help with. Verse number 5 is the responsibility that we all have before God. But now let's look further at verse number 5. Every man shall bear his own burden. Some of our burdens are non-transferable. The Lord has given to each person his own work. Did not Paul say to the Philippian brethren, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? And in Galatians 6 and verse 4, right up above here, but let every man prove his own work and then shall he have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. When we do things for the Lord and things that are right and obey the Lord, we can rejoice in that and should rejoice in that. The Ethiopian eunuch began his walk with the Lord in Acts chapter 8. And when he came up out of the water, he went on his way rejoicing. That's just the beginning of the rejoicing that we have in the Lord when we bear our burdens and perform our responsibility toward Him. No one can believe for you and me. The children need to have their own faith. Some people in the church have inherited religion. They only attend the Lord's church because that's the way they were brought up. Well, that's when they need to be brought up that way. But each person must develop their own faith and understand this is why we meet on the Lord's Day. This is why we partake of the Lord's Day. But this is why we sing and not use instrumental music in the church. And this is why we believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Each and every person in the church needs to have that conviction. We need to have our own. Paul said something, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. We can only overcome the world when we have our own faith. 
For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God, 1 John 5, verse 4 and 5. Some people go astray after they get out from home because they don't have their own convictions. They don't have their own faith. And in essence, and the Lord knows who they are, they're not really going astray at all because the Lord never had them. In Hebrews 11 and verse 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. No one can be baptized for you. No one can repent for you. No one can work for the Lord for you. No one can make the good confession for you. No one can assemble and worship God in your place. And this is one of the arguments against those that let singing groups get up and perform before the congregation. And the rest of the members don't sing. They cannot sing for us. No one can get up here and take the Lord's Supper for us and have a very fanciful way of doing it, drinking the cup. They can't do that for us. Each and every one has to worship and serve the Lord themselves. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death? Therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, and like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the of life. Romans 6, 3 and 4. Each and every one of us must come up out of that watery grave of baptism and walk a new life for Christ. No one can work for the Lord in our stead. Each and every one of us must work. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. No one can overcome the world for you and me. We must do it ourselves, or the world will overcome us. There's no in-between. Either we overcome the world or the world overcomes us. And if we overcome, one day the Lord will say, as it were, come over. In other words, we'll be welcomed into heaven. If we overcome, then we can come over and be with the Lord in heaven. In Revelation 21, 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Each and every one of us have to struggle against trials and temptation and sin in order to be strong enough to overcome the world. No one can resist and overcome trials. No one can do it for us. We cannot get lost in the crowd and hide behind others. You know, there are those that will try to do that. They will try to get lost in the crowd. They don't want to be responsible. Let's turn over to Psalm 33 and verse number 13. What did the psalmist say there? He said, The Lord looketh from heaven, he beholdeth all the sons of men. The Lord beholdeth all people. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. Proverbs 15, 3. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest that is made known in his sight. But all things are naked and open in the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Hebrews 4, 13. And no one can answer for you and me at the judgment, my friends, so that every one of us, Paul said, should give account of himself unto God. Romans 14, 12. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that every one must may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. Every man must receive the things that he has done in his body. According to Paul here in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 10. Now, bear you one of those burdens. There's one kind of burden we must all bear ourselves. That is our responsibility toward God, our obedience to His will, and doing the things that He will have us to do. But then there's another way that we are to bear one another's burdens. 
as we said at the front of the lesson, bear ye one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. In Philippians 2, 4, Paul said, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. There are some who are just so concerned about what they want, what they like, and their burdens, and their problems. They can't see anyone else's. And this is one reason they're so miserable. They're just all the time thinking about themselves. But when I reach out to help my brother and my neighbor, that makes my burden lighter when I'm fulfilling the law of Christ. Some have the attitude, well, my burden is greater than anyone else's. We might think that to be the case. But Paul said, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Think about Christ hanging on the cross and suffering and bleeding and dying there. He was concerned about others. There in John 19, in the context of verse 25 to 27, He said to Mary his mother, who stood at the foot of the cross, Woman, behold thy son. Then he said to the disciple whom he loved, the apostle John, Behold thy mother. He was concerned about the care of his mother. But he was also rendering a great blessing to the Apostle John. When Jesus suffered and bled on the cross in Luke 23 and verse number 43, And Jesus said unto him, That is the thief who repented, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. He was concerned about that thief. He was concerned about those who had sinned against him there. In Luke 23, 34, Then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, and they parted his raiment and cast lots. And of course, that forgiveness would be dependent upon their repentance and obedience unto the Lord. In fact, the very suffering and, and dying of Christ upon the cross was for others. He had no sins to bear. But he died for our sins according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3. The apostle Peter makes it very vivid and plain. In verse Peter 2 and verse number 24. What did he say? Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed. We were healed by the sacrifice, the suffering, and the stripes of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. But He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon Him. And by His stripes we are healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to His own way. And the Lord hath laid on Him the iniquity of us all. As Isaiah the prophet said in chapter 53, Think about those in life who are bearing burdens that we're not even aware of. Think about the young mother and the family there of that little child we talked about this morning. Or our neighbors across the street that I mentioned. And we could just mention example after example of this. But to really understand the context of Galatians 6 and 2, we need to look at verse number 1. Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Although the one overtaken in a fault must take the steps to be restored himself, we as Christians are to help him to reach those steps and to take those steps. We are to help him to bear that burden. We cannot repent for him or confess sin or turn to the Lord again for him, but we can help him. We can help him by persuading him to do what is right, by setting a godly example. Paul said that we are to restore such an one. In the original, this year was used to mean to set in joint again. You ever had a broken bone and the doctor had to set it back in place? Or a joint out of place that an orthopedic surgeon had to set back again? 
This is the idea of the literal meaning of the word restore, but spiritually the connotation is to help this person to be right again, to be right with the Lord, to be restored and right with God again. James speaks of the importance of this task. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him, let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. James 5, verse 19 and 20. So as we look at Galatians 6 and 1, we are to restore such a one. That is, those who are spiritual. You can't expect worldly or carnally minded people to do this. It must be those who are spiritual. And they must do it in the spirit of meekness. They are to be meek in this matter. They are to do it with the right attitude. They're not to be proud or arrogant or have the attitude, well, I, you know, I would never do such a thing as that. We're supposed to have the spirit of meekness. Considering ourselves, lest we also be, be tempted. Because we ourselves, all of us know, even those who are spiritual, that we have sinned and we have weakness. And there are times that we have fallen and needed to be lifted up again. We are to consider our own need for forgiveness and help and the blood of Christ from time to time that we all need and we are to restore such a one in that spirit. But now this idea of bearing one another's burdens has a, a broader meaning, not just one who's fallen, but those who have the burden of sorrow. We are to rejoice with them that do rejoice and to weep with them that weep. Romans 12 in verse 15. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 26. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Have you ever just been to a place of exasperation? What am I going to do? But then someone comes along and helps you with that burden. It doesn't seem nearly so big anymore, does it? with the help that they render. There and there are those who have the burden of leadership. This is a burden. You know, Moses knew that burden. Elders have that burden. The Lord knew this when he gave the words to Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 and 13. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. And all of us in the church have burdens and we get discouraged and we need lifting up. And what does Hebrews 3.13 say? Exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. We are to encourage and to strengthen one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 14. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. And we are also to comfort and to edify, to build up one another. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. Preachers have a burden to bear, certainly, to preach the word, to be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and joy with all long suffering and doctrine. Second Timothy four, one and two. I know as a preacher that laboring with a congregation, especially if you're out in a place distant from home, you can be very discouraged. And there are, sadly, as there were among the children of Israel, people in the church that won't encourage you, but will discourage you. But then there will be someone like Barnabas, son of consolation, who will encourage you in the congregation and lift you up. We need that. You know young people have burdens. They face a lot these days. We are to encourage our young people and to strengthen them and to let them know we believe in them. A lot of people just need to know that we believe in them because they are down on themselves. Then people at the law and our civil leaders need encouragement. Think about what we're going through in this country. 
think about the police. You know, we may look at that policeman, you know, wearing the badge and a you know, big strong fellow and all this. Well, he's strong. He doesn't need encouragement. Yes, he does. They become an open target to many people. What about our rulers and leaders in the land? First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. I exhort therefore that first of all supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness, godliness and honesty. You know, one thing we can say to people that have great responsibility, whether it be leaders in the church, or people in the law, or civil rulers, or leaders, is that simply, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. And we are pray for them, for the Bible teaches us to do so. There's the burden of poverty and sickness that many people have. In Galatians 6.10, as we have therefore opportunity to let us do good unto all men, especially unto them that have some faith. We remember that those on the right hand, the sheep on the right hand in Matthew 25, the Lord depicts as those, I was a hungry and gave me meat, I was thirsty and you gave me drink, I was naked and you clothed me. And we know that scripture. The Lord is pleased with those individuals. Think about people that have all kinds of burdens and need help. How can we help to bear their burdens? One thing we can be an example, like Jesus was. The former tree ties of I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Acts 1 1. We read of Jesus Christ, that he went about doing good, and that God was with him. Acts 10, verse 38. Paul says to Timothy, To be an example, let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word and conversation in charity, in spirit, in faith, in purity. One thing that we can do is to pray one for another. And we must do that. We should do that. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James 5, verse 16. Going back to the idea of believing in people. Look at what Jesus said to Peter. In Luke 22, verse 31 and 32. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. You know, old Satan did have Peter there for a time. Peter denied the Lord three times. But then Jesus said, But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen thy breath. He let Peter know that he believed in him, that he prayed for him, that he would be converted, and that he would be in a position to strengthen the brethren. Many people just need to know that we believe in them. Then last of all this morning, we need to cast our burden upon the Lord. Go back to Psalm 55 and verse 22, and of course, this is perhaps where Peter got the principle of 1 Peter 5, 7. We know he got from the Holy Spirit. He was an inspired man of God. When he said, cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he said, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. But the psalmist said, cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Isn't that a great thought right there? That we are to cast our burden upon the Lord. And many times we don't do that. We don't trust the Lord like we should. We are to trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thy own understanding. Proverbs 3 5. Some burdens are simply too heavy for us as human beings, and without the Lord we can't make it. John 15 5, Jesus said, For without me you can do nothing. We are to pray with the attitude that we need the Lord. We're depending upon Him. We're casting our burden upon Him. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication. With thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7. I don't know how I can make it 
Have you ever thought that before or felt that way? Well, I believe we all have. But the Lord knows how you can make it. Let's trust in Him. Jesus prayed, Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as I will. You know, the Lord did not remove that cup. In Luke 22, 42, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. It wasn't God's will to remove the cup of the cross. But, verse 43, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. But God gave him strength to bear up under it. That's what God did. You remember that Paul prayed three times that his thorn in the flesh might be removed. There, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, 12 and verse 7 and 8, but the Lord gave him strength. He gave him grace to bear it up. Verses 9 and 10, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for, that for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Paul said, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. God gave him strength to bear. Paul wrote from a Roman prison, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. As we close today, let us bear our own responsibility and burden before God. Galatians 6, 5. But then on the other hand, let us help others with their burdens of life by bearing one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ and let them help us bear those kind of burdens. In all things, let us trust the Lord and cast our care upon Him. The greatest burden that man has ever had or ever will have is a burden that only Christ can lift off of us. That only His blood, the precious blood of Christ, 1 Peter 1, 19, can take away, and that is our sins, which His blood does wash away. Revelation 1, 5. And the Lord invites us to come to Him that we can take His yoke upon us. He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor under heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. The Lord's burden is light because He is there to help us bear it. Because we have love to make that burden lighter, and we have the Lord and Him watching over us and giving us strength. This morning we encourage and invite any who may need to come to the Lord to have the burden of sin lifted. As an unfaithful member of the church to repent and pray God's forgiveness, Acts 8, 22-24. Indeed, burdens are lifted at Calvary. For those who have never rendered obedience to the gospel, burdens are lifted at Calvary by hearing and believing the gospel, Mark 16, 15. In repentance, Acts 2, 38. Confession of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, Acts 8, 37. And arise, be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Acts 22, 16. The one who died at Calvary can lift that burden. If you need to come, we invite and encourage you while we stand together and we sing. <clears throat> Jesus is calling, calling, calling. Jesus is calling today. Why should I linger, linger?
turn to 370. 370. We'll sing this song to prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper. 370. Night with them Father, I will be thy high holy name. Thank you for your son's death and cross, and we may have the remissions of our sins. And help us as we protect this for your fine. Remember your son's death for us and the cross. In Jesus' name, amen.
we will have the offering. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank Thee for all the many blessings of life. We thank Thee for our livelihood, our food, clothing, shelter, and health, transportation, and for all the many blessings that are good and for the gift, especially for the gift of Thy Son and the salvation of Him. Father, may we show our love and thanksgiving toward Thee by giving back a sacrificial portion of Thy which Thou so richly bless us with. And may these funds be used to the furtherment of Thy kingdom and to Thy glory, and Thy will be done in Christ. Amen.